already from Rob, looking at the overview of so many of these issues. And, um, and what we want to do with this session today is bring this down to look at East Anglia and Kent in particular, and look at how this works out with our food systems that we have here. Um, I'm Natasha Grist, and I work at the Norwich Institute for Sustainable Development. Um, we work across a number of institutes, the University of East Anglia, John Innes Centre, Quadrum Institute, um, Earlham, Center, Earlham Institute and Sainsbury Laboratory looking at, um, so we have researchers working on all sorts of interdisciplinary subjects. Um, with the NISD we focus on food security and food sustainability and we bring together um, researchers and um, practitioners from all across the sciences, the social sciences and business to look at issues around food security and sustainability. Um, we have uh, today got a set of speakers together to look at a couple of contentious issues that we're dealing with with food systems in the regions. And um, the basis, really, that came that was for us to, to start thinking through these issues, we're looking at in the last few years, um, food availability had a serious crisis in the region and we, with COVID and Brexit. Um, we've seen a lot of people moving towards food poverty and in some of these areas that we live in there are pockets of serious deprivation. Uh, at the same time we've had a lot of farm businesses come to us saying that they're in serious difficulties and some of those businesses going under and the manufacturers and the food producers who aren't often heard so much in these arena also coming and reporting similar kinds of issues. And so it just seems like this is something we really need to be working on. And also, at the same time, a lot of collaboration is needed to bring together all the skills and the understandings across the whole of the food system to think through what do we do in this particular situation now in order to keep moving towards some kind of sustainability. So we've had a look at the food system already with Rob. Um, I've just put this up here. You'll all be really familiar with this kind of diagram. What we want to do today is to look at the areas of the processing and packaging, the wholesaling and retailing, a little bit around the consuming, because a lot of the focus has been and still continues to be around food production when we talk about sustainability. And those intermediaries are not heard as much for a number of reasons that we will hear a bit more about today. Second conceptual framework we're thinking through and would love to have your ideas around is about the sustainability and how we move towards a sustainable type of food system in the UK and in our regions. Around sustainability, Traditionally, there's been a lot of focus on the environmental impacts of that sustainability around the biodiversity loss, water um, issues, and availability, um, food itself, food security, and the growth and the yields of those particular crops under the various environmental stresses. And also, um, we then tend to focus on those, and there's less emphasis on these two other areas around sustainable food systems, looking at the economic impacts of that around economic opportunities and jobs, and also around the social impacts of social sustainability. And I think that's one area which is really under-researched and misunderstood at the moment around the equity issues of that, the justice and fairness of culturally access to resources and culturally appropriate foods that people need. And that discussion is happening at an international level, at the SDG level, and so on, but that hasn't really made it through in any academically rigorous way through to our food systems that we're dealing with at the moment. What we do see is an increase in food poverty and um, therefore a response to that with social supermarkets and food banks exploding. But what we don't have is the academic side that backs up what is happening conceptually. And how does that actually feed into an understanding of sustainability and how we measure that sustainability? So very brief snapshot of East Anglia and Kent. Um, these figures are all debatable and reported differently, but it depends which organisation is reporting what. So it's really just a kind of broad brush um, to give you an idea. In the east of England, there's a focus on production of arable crops. They produce 
Uh, nearly 60% of the local of vegetables produced in the UK, mostly around the area of, of the wash. Um, they major in logistics and processing, which is um, not really understood particularly well outside of the manufacturing and food processes themselves. There are several food enterprise zones which have been set up in the last 10 years. We have a, a, a number of agri-food research hubs and um, the agri-food technology is worth a lot of money and is one of the areas of largest growth in East, of, in East Anglia. And we have several uh, farms and production processes which are considered leaders in the net zero, which we might hear more of a bit later. In Kent, um, again, these numbers about who's employed in food are a bit debatable, um, but Kent is, is a major cereal and fruit and vegetable producer, also has a lot of livestock grazing, um, a lot of businesses are involved in uh, food and drink production. It's much higher than the pro usual proportion in the UK. But most of these businesses are involved in primary production um, and consequently also have um, very low amounts of income uh, per person due to the very low wages for farmers. Um, there's also been a decline in production broadly over the last few years. So we're going to look at two different contentious points today. Um, what I wanted to do was, um, for us in the session in our discussions, was highlight two of the areas which aren't really talked about enough or in a robust enough way at the moment. And the first area that we want to look at is around UK supermarkets and whether and how they might be able to um, be forces for good in our approaches to sustainability uh, looking at uh, potentially shorter supply chains and fairer prices to suppliers. And we have uh, with us James Smith, who is the owner of Loddington Farm, who's been uh, one of the, the um, forerunners in moving towards a more regenerative type of agriculture. And James, if I could hand over to you. Yep. Thank you. Thanks, Natasha. Um, I hope you can hear me all right. Um, I'll apologise now, you're not going to get lots of um, slides and facts and figures, um, uh, so that's all you've got when it comes to PowerPoint. So, um, it's an interesting statement, uh, and I suppose uh, why am I up here um, to lead some discussion around that statement? Uh, I'm a fifth generation fruit grower, and our family have been uh, farmers and, and fruit growers just out of Maidstone since 1882, when my great-great-grandfather bought our farm. And I've been back in our business for about 20 years, uh, well, exactly 20 years, in fact. Um, before then, I, I went to the uh, University of Reading, sorry. Um, yeah, we can't all be perfect, but um, I, I, did a, I had a degree in crop science there, and uh, mainly because I was interested in farming, but I've also got a reasonably scientific mind, so I didn't want to just study straight agriculture. And then I, I finished university, came back to the industry to work in in soft fruit and top fruit growing, uh, and, and then I, I had three years working for a fresh produce importer, and I was importing uh, salad crops and uh, then avocados. At some point while I was working for the salad team, someone said, um, the bloke that looks after avocados has left, does anyone know about the trees? And someone said, Smithy's dad's got a fruit farm, he can do it. So I ended up importing, being responsible for importing avocados for, uh, for about three years. That was a really interesting experience in that it gave me uh, a, a different kind of perspective of working with growers, exporters, packers, UK supermarkets, and whilst working for a UK importer, but also fundamentally being a UK producer. So it gave me quite a unique perspective in terms of supply chains and how this all works. And one of my jobs as, uh, at the time uh, was, a, was to look at um, managing the, the transition between uh, avocados coming from different countries um, because of course you can get avocados 12 months of the year they're, they're grown in some countries all year round such as Mexico near the, the, the equator um, but otherwise we used to sort of move between Israel, Spain, South Africa, Mexico later on Chile, Peru and so I used to do quite a lot of interesting travelling but one of my least enjoyable jobs was being dragged up to MS headquarters in London to explain why the avocados were brown inside. Now, we never really came up with a suitable explanation because you can still buy avocados that are brown inside now. So I suspect there's probably a young technical manager somewhere 
having similar conversations with uh, supermarket technical managers and um, screaming at them and wanting to know why the quality is not good enough. Since then, I've been, uh, I came back to our family farm, uh, as I say, 20 years ago, and my father wanted to look at sort of retiring and, and stepping down, and he, he realised there was a need to modernise our, our business. And so I spent the last 15 years, well, from 2003 to 2018, um, trying, to, trying to work out how a medium-sized family business could uh, be profitable while supplying apples to UK retailers. And that was all about kind of modernisation, intensification, investment in modern orchards, investment in the right varieties of apples, maximising um, output, maximising the quality uh, of the, the crop we were producing, uh, and, and doing everything we could around all aspects of fruit growing. But what I didn't realise in that time is that I was, my, my farm was becoming less and less interesting. So we were becoming increasingly driven through a, a monoculture model trying to do the right thing um, by our supermarkets. Now, much more recently, well, I say that, um, as you get older, it's funny, isn't it? You sort of hear people, I remember when I was 18 working in a pub and the old boys the other side of the bar going, oh yeah, well, 30 years ago, I remember one like, that's ridiculous, I wasn't born then. So now we are, again, 25 years ago, 30 years ago. Um, but really, it, over the last, since doing enough field scholarship in 2016, uh, where I was trying to look at how we could run a profitable fruit growing business in the UK on our sky scale, which for, for reference was about 2,000 tonnes of, of red apples to our supermarkets. Um, the biggest UK grower is now probably 10 15,000 tonnes, so we were kind of middle of the road at the time. And I, I went out and actually the take home message from my apple scholarship was that um, if you want to be profitable growing apples, then move to New Zealand. Now, I've been sponsored by the UK top fruit industry, so that wasn't really, couldn't be the, the sole message of my, my scholarship. But um, it made me realise that we were, we were facing, a, facing a few problems in our own business. And since then, uh, I've unpicked a whole load of different aspects, and it actually relates to all food, food and farming businesses in the UK and around the world in that we've all been led down intensification, specialisation, and focusing on being efficient down single streams of, of production. We've lost the mix in mixed farming, and so I then realised that my farm had become just homogenous orchards of the same variety of apples, all trying to keep Tesco, Sainsbury's, Waitrose, whoever happy in the UK. And we were seeing that, A, we were losing the diversity uh, we were losing diversity in terms of biodiversity, nature and wildlife on our, in our farms and in our landscapes, but also that we were working harder and harder to produce more and more fruit because every time we did a bit better, the price got a bit lower. And in every sector, the, the drive for cheap food is the one that has driven most of the problems we're seeing in our modern food production systems. And we were no different. We always thought, oh, we're the good guys. We're perennial crops. We don't do any tillage. We don't do... Um, a lot of things that the arable sectors are doing, and so we're, you know, we're, we're actually part of the solution. But in any given sector, when you look at the problems, um, you realise that uh, there's a, uh, we've all gone down uh, the, probably the wrong path at some point. And then it's how you navigate your way out of it. The role that supermarkets can play in terms of being a force for good will mean that they need to radically change the way they do business. In my time as a commercial fruit grower, I would say that working with supermarkets has been one of the most unpleasant and disingenuous ways of doing business I've ever come across. Now, they claim to be supporting British, they claim to be looking after the consumer, but it is one of the most unpleasant ways of doing business that I have ever, ever come across. To the point where I have now abandoned 85% of my modern orchards and have basically turned away from supplying supermarket retailers and I'm focusing more on my own small farm shop. And so what I've done is instead of trying to fight to survive at the scale I was at, I've shrunk radically to, um, to di diversify and become niche. And what's really interesting, that process started three years ago when I bought a juice business um, called Owl Fruit Juice. Uh, it's a shameless pump for our business. It's really delicious juice. Um, <laughs> should be should be in the cafe here. Um, 
But, um, but when I bought that brand, I realised that all of a sudden I'd gone from being a producer of a raw material to large supply chains to someone with a brand and a product that was consumer facing. And all of a sudden I thought, this brand is a window to my business. And now my job is to make myself relevant to my consumers. And I've taken that a step further now that we're building a new farm shop. I've taken over our local farm shop and we're now building a new one, which is due to open in the next few months. And now the farm shop and our retail sector drives all of my decision making. So instead now of me being this behind the scenes person pouring the heart and soul into a raw material for retailers, we now have our own retail, our own window for our own consumers to come and see how their food is produced on our farm. And I champion regenerative farming, and um, I record a podcast with a friend of mine, Ben Taylor Davis. It's called Farming for Change, which you can ever listen to. It's all about um, regenerative farming practices, and it, uh, I'm not necessarily an expert, but I like having a lot of conversations around it. So they, they're quite good fun, and it normally means people taking the mickey out of me, but um, they, they do make for good reading. But in order for supermarkets to be a force for good, they do need to look at shorter supply chains. I was sending four or five trays of Gala apples to Kilmarnock, you know, um, which wasn't good value for anybody. Um, but also, they need to do business in a way that is genuine and legitimate. But for me, you know, I'm vertically integrated with my own retail and my own customers. Um, I have a product, I talk to my customer, they like it, I say that's the price, and I give them the product and they give me the money. Now that shouldn't sound revolutionary, should it? But you try working with UK retailers because it is absolutely horrendous. We used to have it that we were sending fruit into depots, the supermarket depots, and they hadn't even told us how much the, the price was going to be. So you didn't know what, how much money you were going to get having done all the work and putting the money, putting the product into the depots. And then when you worked on the price, you worked out actually it wasn't profitable. But you had to supply, otherwise you'd lose the business. So, in order for them to be a force for good, they have to radically change the way they do business. At the moment, they're entirely driven by profit and keeping shareholders happy. And at the moment, through the, during this, this period of the cost of living crisis and in inflation in food, what we've seen is a significant increase in the price the retailer, that the consumer is paying, and actually they're putting their prices down to the, the suppliers. So all of that extra is staying with the retailer. So I believe they can be a force for good. I personally don't want to supply them anymore um, because I'm going to do my own retailer on a much smaller scale and try and have fun doing it. But they play a massively important role. You know, they are where the majority of people shop. They are, they are the, um, the source of, of food for everyone. But what they do is they, they, they take credit for feeding the nation. They don't. Farmers feed the nation. The retailers get in the way. And until we can fix a completely broken supply chain, there are going to be nothing like a force for good. Thank you so much, James. I um, have a few minutes for any questions or thoughts around this. Yes, if you could say your name as well and where, you, where you're from, it'd be great. Is it on? Can people hear me? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, hold it, Sorry, I'll speak a bit louder. Um, so I'm Marcus Travers. I'm at Anglia Ruskin University. Um, I'm the head of agri tech there. I actually live on a farm. Um, uh, God, I could ask you so many questions. But the, the two that really sort of spring to mind in are, do you think that in terms of the training that you probably need in your business now, do you think you get that the right kind of support from people like Pepper in terms of the training that, and, and support they make available. I say that we, we've got a lot of farmers around the Peterborough area where I, I'm based. And we started putting them on a thing called the Help to Grow program, which they probably run at the University of Kent. That's a program that helps farmers understand business. Not farming, but business. So diversification, supply chain management, social media marketing, all those things that modern small businesses need to do. Yeah. It's not the sort of thing you have to see on a different website. Yeah. It's a government program, which is a good thing, and it's it's partly funded. The other thing that so that's one thing about do you think you get the support you need 
for the new business that you've created. And the other thing is, do you really think the supermarkets have got a future when you look at the, the fact that a lot of young people don't even go to a supermarket? But my son, uh, um, who's very interested in food, still buys probably about 50% of what he eats via, um, you, you know, think, I can't remember what he eats, but things like delivery. Mm. Yeah. So he's not even using a supermarket. Two very good questions. I think uh, to answer the first one, I think um, with diversification you need a good degree of entrepreneurial entrepreneurial spirit, and and not everybody necessarily has that. I think encouraging farmers to operate as businesses is absolutely crucial, um, and I think. One of the one of the trickiest things for me is what's what sort of like unlocked my kind of passion for doing what I do has been this the penny dropping about the way we farm and where that has to change. And then once you start kind of my analogy is that it's a bit like finding a loose fit on your jumper and you kind of pull that and then all of a sudden the sleeve's gone and then you know the, the rest of the thing starts to fall apart. And that is a bit like stopping, standing back, looking at your business and looking at how can I, you know. What harm am I doing in the way that I farm? Um, how can I stop that? And then how can I put things back? So move away from the reductionist model to a, a, a positive one. Now, I don't know how DEFRA can help with that journey because they don't seem to understand it themselves. But um, I think now, the, you know, to change from being a food producer to being a retail-focused business that produces food, because what I'm not interested in doing is, is stopping farming. You know, for me, my business is underpinned by producing healthy food from a, a very healthy, robust farming system, and then demonstrating that, and, and then pushing that message through my um, through my, my my shop and, and other brands. Uh, I think the, the the idea, these concepts about getting people to think about it in terms of business. What you've got to do is get to get people to start thinking differently. And so, any initiatives that help drive that, I think, are really important. And that's where you know, DEFRA and universities and, and things can really make a difference. Um, you've, got to, you've got to get hold of the farmer first, get them off the farm and, and then start the process, but um, it, is, it is doable. What I like is that with this movement around regenerative farming is that a lot of people, and uh, you know, I'm no longer a younger generation, I'm kind of like, you know, getting up there now, but um, haven't quite hit the farming average age, I don't think, but um, <laughs> Um, there is a movement, and there are people that are interested in what it has, it has its own energy, and so I think that will help drive that. And if people can, you know, whether it's DEFRA or other organisations can tap into that and, and be part of it, that, that's really what will unlock that. The second question um, was um, about the future of supermarkets. Cynically, I'd love to see them go out of business. Um, <laughs> yeah, it'd be amazing. What I, what I, and this will come into what Flo's going to talk about in the, under the second statement, so I'm not going to get too involved with that because I think we can probably pick it up at the end. But I think the, the more people challenge what they're eating and what they're being supplied, what they're being told, and, and get in touch with local farms and food, there's, there's lots of interest. People really want to come to our farm. So going back, we talked about the net zero eggs. I have 200 chickens laying hens on our, our farm, which I wouldn't have done before until I had a farm shop. <coughs> When my egg supplier was supplying us with Polish eggs because they couldn't get British, I was like, well, this is, this is like the Ludington farm shop was selling Polish eggs. Like, I'm not having it. So I, I quickly made a, a chicken, mobile chicken tractor, you know, the, the, the egg mobile type model. You've probably all seen it on, you know, a polyface file or, you know, Richard Perkins and all this sort of stuff. But built one of those, got 100 chickens, and then built another one, got another 100 chickens. And I'm selling more eggs than I've ever sold. And people often ask, oh, are they free range or are they this X, Y, Z? And I said, well, look, technically they're not free range because of the, 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 these bits and pieces. Technically they're not organic because of X, Y, and Z. But if you want to know about your eggs, just come and see the chickens. You know, come and have a look. Come just wander down from the farm shop, come and see the chickens. And actually what I want to do is end up that I self-certify, or my consumers certify the way I farm. And you can only do that by getting them onto the farm. Because, you know, if you want to go and see, uh, you know, a, massive chicken farm, it's not all that pretty and you wouldn't be all that encouraged to keep buying the eggs. But when you come and see, you know, a small scale local farm that is producing food in the, in the right way, the doors are always open, then that, I think, taps into younger people that are much more interested and much more motivated around what they're eating 
And I know there's a breakout session later on about you are what you eat, and you know, I totally believe in that. So I think, um, love to see them go out of business, don't think it's going to happen soon, um, and I'd love an ex Tesco's buyer come to me for a job at some point. <laughs> Ready for a job interview. Um, awesome. Brilliant. Thank you so much, James. Um, we, I know we've got more questions, but I'd like to go to Flo and then Alex, and then we'll come back to have more time at the end, if that's okay. So um, I'd like to welcome um, Florcia Hütter, um, who's the Chief Executive of Produce in Kent and has helped to organise this session, so thank you so much. Um, the second contentious issue that we all facing that came up in what Rob was presenting at the beginning was saying that buying local is more expensive and this is what consumers say is stopping a lot of them from actually buying local produce and we will all have seen in some of the kind of niche farm shops in the regions that we go to around where we live that prices of those foodstuffs is actually quite high, in some cases higher than, um, than the produce that we might buy in the supermarket, and that influences people's buying choices. And so Flo is going to speak to that first. Thank you, Flo. Thank you very much, Natasha. Um, so yeah, Flo Jehutta, uh, I work for Producing Kent, and we are a membership organisation for local independent food and drink businesses in Kent and Medway. So we represent growers, secondary producers, Wholesale, retail, and hospitality, so the whole chain. Um, we give different types of support, but we're also increasingly thinking about the regional food system as such, um, predominantly through the Kent Food Partnership, which we set up this year with Social Enterprise Kent. So, um, this statement, I, I created an, a, a rot for my own back with this statement, um, <laughs> uh, and I've made loads of notes, so I hope I, I'll get through that. Um, buying local will never catch on unless we find ways to make local sustainable product more affordable. Okay. Sorry. Wrong way around. Yeah, no, no, it's fine. Okay. There we go. So, uh, first of all, what makes local sustainable product more expensive? And I've put expensive between brackets because, you know, it is a, it is a relative term, as we'll notice further down my talk. So. Let's first see at, at, the, at the different factors. Sustainable growing practices, better animal welfare, artisan food production methods will all have an effect on price. So we're talking about, for example, regenerative farming, the initial investment in changing your practices, uh, maybe larger pastures, dwelling areas, different techniques. You might have a slightly smaller yield, which will have a, uh, an, a, an effect on price. Uh, artisan food production methods, uh, manual methods rather than mechanized. Uh, using local ingredients, all that will have an effect. Uh, second one, size business and the inability to scale. So most food and drink producers, secondary producers I'm talking about, are micro-sized. Our membership is, I would say, 70 to 80 percent micro-businesses, so one to five employees. Um, they have been very much impacted in the last years, um, especially by rising production prices, You've got a small business, rising overheads and production prices means you will eventually have to carry on that price to the customer, although they're very reluctant to do so, uh, especially in the last year. Many small producers have had to do that. Um, I would say the jump from a kitchen top where many small producers start to a commercial space is a big one, even in the best of times. Again, looking at the last couple of years, a rise in those production costs already, Reserves kind of depleted after all the challenges that they have been dealing with. And then in addition to that, um, uh, scarcity in small size production spaces, uh, increased rents and service costs makes it almost impossible to scale. So people are literally stuck behind that kitchen, kitchen top. Then of course you have the markup, uh, wholesale and retail. Um, some some larger retailers and, and, and larger wholesalers have been accused of greedflation. Uh, what markup do they put on local product uh, that they sell on? So the longer the supply chain you're engaging with as a producer, of course, the bigger that markup. Um, yes, all these factors may influence price, uh, and to some extent maybe they do, but to what extent is it also a perception that we have about the price of our food? Um, what is expensive? Let's look at that term. You know, we are using supermarket prices as a norm, but is that right? Is that correct? 
Um, I looked up the price of a, of a chicken uh, provided by Tesco's yesterday, four pounds. I mean, what does that say about welfare standards of that chicken? What does that say about the labor costs that are of the labor involved in producing that chicken? Uh, and also, what does that say about the price that is given to the chicken farmer who supplies the chicken to the supermarket? I don't think it paints a particularly good picture. Should we rather consider the price of local product as the real price um, or the real value? Maybe we should talk about value instead of price. Because, you know, of the way it's produced, it's grown locally, uh, you know, the businesses are losing local, uh, using local ingredients and they're using local routes to market. They have therefore a positive impact on the local economy. They have a less damaging impact on the environment. And they generally uh, are producing products that have better nutritional and health properties. So in the long term and in the wider picture, maybe local product is less expensive if you look at that overall cost. Is it time to change that narrative? Um, and then in some cases, you know, local is less expensive. It depends where you buy it, when you buy it, and what you buy. So seasonal food is less expensive. Um, you know, in certain areas, certain products are produced that are therefore close to you and less expensive. Um, Natasha did a really nice comparison, quickly for me, um, and looked at uh, organic eggs. Um, and you can see, actually, the ones that are provided by the national supermarket and by a national veg box scheme are more expensive than the local veg box uh, and the, yeah, the two local, local options. So it doesn't always have to be more expensive. But um, in any case, if we compare UK supermarket food prices with those in other countries, UK prices come out is very cheap. I plucked this off the BBC News site. Um, and if you look, especially at eggs, breads and yogurt, you know, they come out as a lot cheaper than the prices in other countries. The prices also show what the local producers are up against. But I think more important to you know, highlight when you look at this uh, little graph, there's loads of these little graphs that you can find on, on the internet, online. There's all sorts of information that is thrown at us. But if you want to compare our food prices with those in other countries, if you want to make those comparative studies, we really need to understand all the factors that influence the prices elsewhere. So what is the market position of large multiples in other countries, for example, when you look at this stat? What are their buying strategies around price, quality, local product? Do other countries have stronger farmer cooperatives or maybe more government regulation or more government support for local product? Are people in other countries maybe just more used to price to pay more for, for, for their products? Are wages in other countries higher? What percentage of wages are spent on mortgage, rent, and utilities? So what amount, actually, have you got left to buy food with? So in summary, we could really do with more research on food prices in the UK, and especially compared to food prices in the other country, in, in countries like this, just to get a more complete picture of food price. And also that, you know, to have the basis uh, and the information to effectuate change in our country. <laughs> so I do recognize that price and to some extent perceived ideas of price are a hurdle for people to buy local, uh, together with a lack of knowledge uh, about an access to local sustainable food. So how can we convince or influence public to buy local and sustainable? I think there's two, two areas we really have to look at. A lot is around education. We need to educate the public on the cost of cheap food. The current argument is that food needs to be cheap because we're in a cost of living crisis. I think cheap food is a tiny sticky plaster on a big festering wound of low wages that have been stagnated for years and that, have, that ha certainly haven't kept up with food inflation. So I think we need to change the narrative again and press for action on addressing the causes for the cost of living crisis rather than its effects. And, you know, in, in a way, making the food producers and growers 
the culprits. <coughs> Cheap, ultra-processed, mass-produced, substandard inf imported food will cost us a hell of a lot more in the longer term in terms of healthcare cost, environmental damage, and we also risk, as James has said earlier, decimating a grower community in the UK. So lots of bad effects in the longer term. The value of local food, second one. We need better statistics on the economic, environmental, social and health um, value of local sustainable food, especially at a regional level. If we can show with information, with numbers, how local sustainable food positively impacts our local economy, providing employment, putting money back into the region, attracting visitors, a very important one, um, how it impacts our community by providing pride of place, hubs to come together, uh, the environment by looking after our soil, countryside by shortening supply chains, and health and well-being by providing greater nutritional value, then that will not just change customer behavior, but it also unlocks funding and puts the attention of the government more on food, where it should be. We need to educate the public on cooking. We need to reintroduce food into the school curriculum from primary onwards. Children have no idea how to, you know, where local food comes from, let alone how to prepare it, and prepare it in a way that doesn't break the bank. It is possible, but people need to be learned from a very young age onwards. We so, also, sorry, just yeah. just we also need to invest in food-related community initiatives, uh, teaching the wider community. We need to teach those people who can afford to support local to walk the walk and not just talk the talk. A lot of people talk about supporting local, but are they actually buying it? Um, very quickly touching upon certain, you know, a couple of initiatives that will change customer behavior, um, uh, improving uh, access and also knowledge about local food. So we have, you know, supermarkets and high streets have little, little local on offer and local retail is not always easily accessible because it's out in the countryside. So how can we reintroduce local to a wider public, even at a better price perhaps? Retail pop-ups. Producing Ken at a retail prop up in Blue Water. Uh, we came to a special arrangement with Blue Water, um, who gave us a special price. Therefore, we could introduce a lot of local producers to a new audience at a high footfall area. Great way to do business, great way for our producers to get in front of a new audience. Uh, food hubs. In um, Kent here, we run Kent Food Hubs. It's an open online platform for local producers selling direct to customers. Customers buy stuff online on this platform and then they come to collect it at a physical pickup space where it's fulfilled, where the orders are, are fulfilled. By shortening the supply chain, the producer can get a better price, consumer pays less. Can food hubs are not profit driven, they're very much about making sure that local producers earn a fair living. A uh, platform could use as a, uh, is, is, is being used now as a business-to-customer model, but could also be developed into a business-to-business -business model, selling, selling to retail, catering, and hospitality. Um, it could be several locations, typically in town centres, where the offer of local is much less than perhaps in rural areas, where you have farm shops, etc. Last but not least, shared production space is the old one out because it's indirectly giving customers better access to more affordable products because it helps SMEs scale. And that's what I said earlier, scale is important and comes before innovation. People need to scale their production in order to become financially sustainable, to have that res reserve, to become more competitive in their prices, but also to innovate. So scale before innovation. So in summary, I'm sorry I've taken up too much time. I don't agree. I think local will catch on, but we need to change the narrative around local and create better access by developing a purpose-driven local trading infrastructure, not driven by profit, driven by purpose. Thank you very much. That's great. Let's move straight on to our sort of protagonist on this, um, Alex Lato. He runs the Food Innovation Cluster, which is based up at the University of East Anglia. We've been working with um, many small and medium-sized enterprises that work across all sorts of things, but food in particular. And over to you, Alex. Ten minutes. 
thank you, I've got my timer here, so hopefully it should be fine. Um, yeah, so very much like Flow, um, the Food Innovation Cluster at the UEA has been running since 2021, um, and it's a membership organisation as well. Uh, we're working with um, food and drink manufacturers. At this stage we have over 500 members, of which 250 are food and drink businesses. Um, and as Flo mentioned, about 80% of those are micro-businesses, so less than five employees. And what I'm going to talk about today is more or less from their perspective, um, hopefully. Um, it's always that difficult challenge to try and talk on behalf of 200 businesses that, that I talk to uh, daily about their, their issues, in particular around sustainability and affordability. Um, and I'm very happy that I think we're all in agreement, in agreement around supermarkets, which is great, so it won't be controversial when I say it later on. Um, so, I have got a couple of slides very quickly. Um, the first one is everything that's bad. And the second one is potentially opening up to some solutions and some ideas of things that could make things um, better and help make local products affordable and sustainable. Um, the cost of living crisis, I think the first point to note is that most businesses feel it directly as well. Um, and as Flo mentioned, a lot of businesses are based at home. And we're talking about the cottage industry or you know, the micro businesses. A lot of the time, you know, their energy bill for their business is their energy bill for their home, and if they're using the electricity for, for cooking products or, or, or making products, then um, you know that that ends up being on their on their margin. So reducing pricing isn't always the solution, and I think the the important aspect is to have fair pricing for those food and drink manufacturers, um, and to help them build their business um, and build their business model. And I think we mentioned earlier about training farmers and the help to grow scheme on how to run a business. Um, I think it's key to point out that most micro businesses aren't business people either. They might just, you know, have done something for 20 years in their careers and all of a sudden decided, I'm really good at making brownies. I'm going to launch a brownie company. And they're really, really good brownies. But, you know, how do you build that price point? How do you build your margin? How do you deal with supermarkets that, or, or, you know, or even farm shops? How do you deal with wholesalers? Um, and navigating the food and drink um, supply chain is not easy. Um, and increasing produ production is not always a solution, so I know you mentioned increasing production, but it's not necessarily the solution. And um, touching upon supermarkets, um, I always advise, always have a word of caution for businesses when they say, oh, my goal is to sell to Tesco. Um, I always ask about two or three times, are you sure? Um, do you really want to sell to supermarkets? You know, where's your business going? What do you, where do you see yourself in five years' time? Um, and this third point that I have is finding places to sell the produce is becoming harder. Um, the East of England Co-op, has, has, uh, for example, has decreased their local product range by about 75% in the last year. Um, they have on, on their targets to sell 20% of local produce in their local supermarkets, but that 20% of local produce represents 1% of sales in their shops, and therefore with their financial pressures that they've had, they have been slashing um, and delisting a lot of products that were banking on that contract alone to run their business. And so that's had an impact on the food and drink manufacturers all of a sudden losing something that probably represented about 30 or 40% of their income um, has just disappeared. So um, we need to find, you know, finding places such as those food hubs and local farm shops. I think they are key to, um, to supporting those food and drink manufacturers. Um, I, I did try and put some environmental sustainability in here um, because we didn't talk about sustainability. Um, my first statement is that bottom line comes before sustainability when you're a micro business. That's not 100% true. There are some businesses that set up with that as, their, as one of their <coughs> core um, objectives and targets and they will do everything to be sustainable. However, um, the majority, the first important thing is um, am I getting profit on my product and am I able to pay my rent at the end of the day. Um, so I don't think it's all on manufacturers or producers um, and I think the local supply chain needs support uh, to, to ensure this is feasible. So everything, and it's kind of those, all these final points are geared together really, um, everything is geared towards bulk um, in food and drink. Um, if you are a small manufacturer and you're looking, you're looking for ingredients to bake or to manufacture a product, um, you'll soon find that you're not getting the best prices because you're ordering very minute quantities of that said ingredient. Um, and I think there is a need for supporting wholesalers to, to pivot potentially some of their business um, towards working with, with smaller businesses um, and you know, to not price out those local manufacturers. Um, and again, support from the public sector and universities, 
Um, I'm just taking Innovate UK off the top of my head. The requirement of having minimum four employees to access KTPs. That price set, that rules out probably 80% of our businesses from accessing that, those funding streams and those, that support from research. Um, and I think we have a massive blind spot in working with those micro businesses and taking time to accompany them um, through their journey and looking at their processes and looking at how they can potentially ensure they produce better, have less waste within their kitchen environment or their, you know, their, their countertop environment, um, ensure that they can then potentially increase production slightly, um, reduce, their, mar reduce their, their, their costs and then therefore reduce their pricing. I think there is a piece of work to be done there as well. So I want to open up with something that might defend supermarkets or it might seem like it. Um, the Rochdale pioneers who founded the co-op model um, happened in a period of, of, of crisis and the cost of living crisis such as this. Um, and now they you know, set up a local wholesale operation and started selling products at an affordable price for their workers. And they realized that they, were, you know, they weren't able to afford food. Now, the co-op model across the UK now is not necessarily the same thing, and those prices aren't necessarily the most affordable. If you have a local co-op near you, you'll know what I mean. They, however, that model came about in a period such as this. Um, last year, I challenged um, a group of students through the iTeams project at UEA. I don't know if you know about how the iTeams work. Um, basically, postgraduates from across the Norwich Research Park, across the institutes and the UEA, um, work on a project for, for two to three months with a business mentor and to answer a challenge. And the challenge that I set was how can we link food and drink manufacturers um, and retailers to social supermarkets and food hubs to ensure people have accessible food um, and we can improve the products that are being sold or provided to food banks. Local products need not be expensive was the, the motto of, or was the idea behind it. Um, this led to Ankerze, which is a non-profit limited company that has been set up, um, inspired by the co-op model, and they're working with big producers and big manufacturers, but also local manufacturers, to uh, shorten that supply chain, supply directly to social supermarkets. Now, briefly two words about social supermarkets. They're not food banks. They do charge a price, but they subsidize the essentials, and so make a loss on certain products and make a profit on donations that they receive, so that kind of balances out their business model and their non-profit. Now, Anchors, they set up as a wholesale supplier to these social supermarkets, and contrary to most wholesalers, they take a flat 3% rate um, margin, which will then fund the operation, um, which is a lot less than what most wholesalers would take. And by taking out that probably 27 to 30% margin that wholesalers normally take, you are already bringing the prices down massively. But they're also adapting that greedflation and kind of coining the, the goodflation um, <laughs> um, model where they're reducing the sizes of packaging. So instead of having a kilo of sugar, it's put in a 250 gram bag. And instead of being a pound, that's 15p at the, at the end. So those essentials that people need to have, the staples, the tea, the eggs, the sugar, the bread, um, working with big manufacturers um, and rebranding it so that it doesn't look like it's that brand in a social supermarket because the big challenge is manufacturers don't want their brand associated with such low cost because otherwise why would they be selling it for £2.50 at the local co-op or at Tesco? Um, and so this model, we've also adapted it to local manufacturers. Um, they have peaks and troughs through the year. Um, when Christmas, they're completely drowned and people are buying gifts and they're willing to pay that little premium for a local product. However, when you get into February and it's kind of down, that's where anchors they come in and guarantee a bottom line coming in for those small manufacturers with an order for a specific product that's being designed, probably cost less to manufacture for that small producer, and that ends up having affordable products that are local artisan products available in social supermarkets for people who are living in poverty and can't actually afford these products normally. So sorry, I went on a long time about that, but I think it's a cool solution and there are examples um, around that as well. So there is an opportunity there for local wholesalers to become suppliers either to, to those local shops but also of primary ingredients. Um, one of the, the big issues with small manufacturers is they'll end up going to macro <laughs> uh, to source their, to source their, their, their supply. Um, 
maybe wholesalers should set up as a, as a cooperative model as well, so applying that co-op model and buying bulk on behalf of local food and drink manufacturers. So maybe that's a kind of a, a challenge there and a bit of, of research to, su to support that would be needed, which is my next point. Um, we don't have much data to support these assumptions, really. Um, affordability um, and how can small businesses make their products cheaper? How can we work with those micro-producers? We don't actually have enough research around that, so there's a, there's a challenge there, really, for, for us to work with them. Um, and so, yeah, I want, I want to just leave it on, could there be a model for wholesale cooperatives um, to ensure local, affordable, sustainable products? That was the topic. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, all of you. Um, let's have a, a short time now um, for questions back to the panel and then I'd love for us to have a quick think through some of the research gaps and identify some areas that we could collaborate on as well. But yes, open to questions, uh, Nuresh. If you could say who you are and uh, where you're from as well. Thank you. Sure, so I'm, I'm Nuresh and I'm from uh, the UEA. Um, thank you to all four of you for a fantastic session this morning. Um, my question is, is mainly to James presenters as well. Um, so uh, I'm interested in agri-food decarbonisation and I'd like to know your thoughts on whether decarbonisation is easier within your current sort of vertically integrated model of business or whether you think it would have been easier with your previous model where you're dealing with um, supermarkets. Now I think I know the answer to your question. Uh, the answer to the question, which is that it's, it's probably easier now, and if that is the case, then um, could you explain why decarbonisation is easier within your current business model compared to the previous business model? Yeah, thanks. That's a, it's a very good question. Um, for me, when it comes to carbon, the way I always look at carbon sort of visualise it in my own mind, is that there's a finite amount of carbon and it's about the distribution of inorganic carbon in the atmosphere versus organic carbon in the soil. So through the, over the last 80 years, the sort of much more reductionist model that has shifted the whole carbon cycle up out of the soil, um, which is where we end up with the, the uh, a skewed distribution. So however you see it, in terms of carbon dioxide or whatever, but inorganic carbon in the atmosphere. And now the driver for businesses to decarbonise um, is looking at how we can kind of slow down. So from a farming perspective, I think we've got the biggest opportunities to decarbonise because we have soil available to us, um, which is the single biggest um, place that we can put organic carbon. And basically it's not, about, it's not about sequestering it permanently in the soil, it's just about shifting that cycle back down again. So, with my current model now, I'd say it's easier to do that because we have much more cyclical business, circular business, should I say. So we, instead of just being apples um, and the, with all the challenges that went with that, so we had soil compaction, we had herbicide strips under our, our trees, um, you know, so missing a lot of the kind of <coughs> principles of regenerative farming. Uh, we were using uh, glyphosate, we were using um, synthetic fertilisers. So, you know, when I used to use the cool farm, cool farm carbon tool to look at what we were doing, um, you know, we were we were buying a lot of inputs that were, um, you know, carbon-based, um, the agrochemicals and everything else. We were burning a lot of diesel. What we're doing now is that we've actually shrunk the, the percentage of commercial orchards and we now have livestock on the farm, and we have this we have this much more regenerative model that moves around. So, and we're we're measuring our, our soil, um, you can call it soil health or you know, whatever you want to call it. But so we're actually starting to gather some metrics now. So first thing, get some baselines. But what we're seeing is that because we have a diverse range of activities on any piece of land now. Um, the intensive orchards we can't do much with. It's quite difficult to kind of retrofit regenerative practices into something that you've gone too far down a particular road. Um, my analogy for that is that when I used to work in the pub, when I thought it was weird that people could remember 20 years ago, there used to be an old boy at the bar, and people would come in and ask for directions, and he'd say, well, you don't want to start from here. And that was, that's part of our problem with modern farming, is that you know, we, we need to go back a few steps. But certainly, 
building um, soil carbon or building soil biology in organic or organic carbon in the soil is much easier under our current model than it used to be under the old one. Um, my name is Rachel. I am a doctoral student at University of York and I also work at the Center for Food Policy at City University of London. Um, another question for James, kind of two in one. Sorry, I'll try to be quick. Um, but a lot of what you were talking about was this kind of fostering this relationship directly to the consumer and having people know where their food comes from. Um, so with that, in terms of fostering like more direct to consumer transactions, um, over here it's veg box schemes are quite often a thing um, where I'm from in the US, community supported agriculture, similar ideas. Um, potentially traveling to farmers markets, those kinds of things. Are any of that part of your particular model for your farm? And then um, kind of in terms of practical solutions, again, where I'm from in the US, um, I come from a very agricultural state, Michigan, which does a lot of soft fruit, apples being one of them, and agritourism is huge there. Not seen as agritourism, but just normal. So I remember every fall, going to the farms, apple picking, doing harvest events, things like that. Is there a role for that over here in this kind of UK context, and what would that be? Thank you. Um, thank you, yeah. I think what we do in terms of consumer engagement is, um, is it, it's, it ties into the second one, actually. Agritourism is a really important part. We're trying to make our farm a destination for people to come to learn about where the food comes from. And once they get hooked on the story of where their food comes from and how we produce it, they're then interested in coming back and buying it from us. So you, you, what you do is we're trying to rebuild those connections between the soil and the consumer. And in order to do that, you need to rebuild, rebuild all of those connections in between, which is very easy when it's just you. Um, so, so we do. Um, we're very. Uh, we do a lot of social media. We don't get involved with veg be box schemes particularly. We do do um, deliveries to elderly people within our local area um, if they require it but what we really want is we want people to come to us so because that's where it happens and that's where the connection starts it's um, you can you can deliver food to people and, and deliver your messaging at the same time but really it's all about getting people on site so we do things now um, a few, I would say five ten years ago you would be able to count the number of people that came to the farm in terms of consumers on one or two hands, it was very, very few. We now host things like Open Farm Sunday, we'll have hundreds of people on a given day coming to the farm, we do farm tours and we talk about everything we're doing. But this year, for the first year, we're doing Pick Your Own Pumpkins. Now, you know, but what we're going to do is we're going to be selling pumpkin pies and we're going to be selling recipes around pumpkins. So you don't just buy a pumpkin, carve it, burn it in your garden and then, you know, wait for next year. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an important food stuff, but it's another thing that people love and it's a part of the story. And every time I host an event, I don't necessarily make, make much money from the event, but that's a new customer that comes to see our farm and see our shop and, and understand the juice business. They start to learn about Owlet at Lullington, and then when they're out and about, they see Owlet. And all of a sudden, you're just getting into the consumer's consciousness. So I think that's the single biggest thing. You, when you become uh, consumer-focused, you completely change the way you think about things and the way you do business. Um, and so making yourself relevant at any level is a really important part of that. I think it's, uh, it's absolutely it's true for farms, but I think it's true for all food and drink businesses, and it's, it's becoming more and more important to build in an experience in whatever it is that you do. So, you know, we have secondary producers who open up their premises and, and talk about their product. We've got retailers who have a whole community hub starting up. Uh, you know, McNeys in Kent is a very good example of that. They do cookery classes uh, during half term. And we've got hospitality businesses who talk more and more about where their food are coming from, is coming from, and make that an integral part of, of the menu. Um, so I think education needs to happen on every single level. I think the marketing of local food and sustainable food is, is, is a little bit neglected perhaps still and I think we need to be much, become much stronger on that and really work together. Uh, it's a concerted effort between local businesses 
public health, education, and local government. We need to kind of have that same messaging out to the public that this is a very important thing to support, not just in the short term, but in the long term. Thank you. And I'd, I'll just add one quick point to that before we go to the next question. Yeah, we've had the same, the same sort of thing in Norwich, but where it's gone a bit broader. So um, we have the Feed, which is a social supermarket, has a business model now where they sell um, they, they sell um, for profit to catering, as part of catering to businesses around the city. They have some cafes set up. Uh, run by volunteers and all of that goes to make a, a business model which is more economically sustainable uh, so that they can support the pricing of their products be a bit cheaper for those who need it and alongside that they're also bringing in some other elements which we wouldn't nat naturally consider to be part of the food system but in their cafes then they're offering not only cookery classes but there's financial training for people that are, have moved into poverty or trying to get out of poverty and have been in poverty for some time. There's other well-being classes. There's um, classes to help integrate asylum seekers into the local community and so on. So it's just other parts that they're bringing in to make this uh, system a little bit more holistic, thinking about how to generate sustainable community, not just sustainable food. So we've got to question there. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Andy Simkin, I'm from the EPIC, uh, well, the Essex Plantinization Centre, University of Essex. Uh, I've got two sort of questions. The first is for James, and the second is just for uh, anyone who wants to answer. Uh, for James, um, you were talking a little bit about your the changes over the last 15 years within your industry, particularly going from a monoculture to your now uh, cyclic uh, model. I was just wondering what the difference is now in the other challenges you face within, within your sector. Uh, and how you're addressing them um, uh, through perception and things like that. And the second question is just for anybody is, um, I've worked in sort of the agricultural industry for quite a while, mainly in plant sciences, and I've worked previously for uh, NIAB, which used to be the National Institute of Agriculture. And then I watched Clarkson's Farm, and even I wasn't <coughs> really aware of some of the challenges within the farming sector. And I was wondering what you think about how education within the public and what do you think the public perception actually is of farming at the moment and do we need more programs like clarks and farm or are they more of an hindrance <laughs> great question james and um, just touching on the second one first and I mean, anyone else can jump in but i think clarkson's farm has been absolutely phenomenal i think um he's he's brought um watchability uh, and you know viewers to uh, open the sort of window built on farming and some of the challenges that um, farmers face. But I think from, for us, I think the UK top fruit sector is, is a, a, I would describe it at the moment as being in terminal decline. It's, um, you, we basically, um, there are a few large fruit growers left, and a few small ones left. Um, as I say, I'm growing, I'm growing about, farming about 25% of the area that I was three years ago. Um, fundamentally, uh, I don't know whether the weather's going to allow me to grow a crop because of the unpredictable nature of it now. If I do grow it, I don't know if I can afford or find the labour to pick the crop um, having grown it. If I do manage to find the labour and pick it, I'm pretty sure I can't afford the electricity to store the crop. And once I've done all that, I know that the UK retailers won't pay me a profitable price. So at no point during that, that sort of growing cycle um, can I see any point in carrying on. Now. Um, and I think that's a major, major worry for UK food, um, full stop, because that's the kind of cycle that most people find themselves in. Um, we, have, we have different challenges now. Um, I do still grow apples. Apples are still really important to us. You know, my great-great-grandfather was the first commercial grower of Bramley seedling in, you know, ever. Um, and uh, we still do grow a few. But So I, I, I still want to be a farmer of which apples are part of my... Um, my, the crops that I produce. Um, with the changes that I've made, things do get more challenging. Um, pigs and chickens don't stay where you put them. Um, you can plant a fruit tree, it might die slowly, but it never moves, and you can go on holiday, come back, and your fruit tree is still there. Um, you, you give a chicken or a pig five minutes without the right you know, um, means, right, and, and it does get pretty tricky. My life, I'm busier now than I've ever been. Um, but I actually can see a, a, a way forward. I think if I'd stay put in commercial fruit growing, um, I would probably be 
print forms on the market now. So um, that's about where we are. Does anyone else want to talk about Clarkson's farm? <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't mind actually. Um, I have not necessarily even, I've watched I think one episode of it, I'm not necessarily drawn to, to Clarkson as a person, but um, in terms of the, what people think of farmers, I think there's a, a trust there. Um, and I was a few months ago in a meeting um, with a food standards agency, and the big thing was can we get businesses to sell genetically modified products? And it was a whole debate. Um, but the, the big thing was, well, actually, if you get farmers and you can, you know, have the, with, you know, the farmers grow it, then you've got the trust behind it. And there was a, a big debate about that. And it comes back to local marketing. I think what Clarkson's Farm is doing is showing that there is trust in farmers and you can see how hard they work. And I think there's something we don't do very well and that he's doing very well is promoting that. And I think producers, manufacturers need to do more of it and say that it's not about the region or where it's from, it's about how it's made and who's making it and the story behind it. Um, and I think on the continent of Europe they're better at doing that and you know, having the labels for their geographical designation and you can know that it's an artisan product or it's been done with care and they have, you know, I guess so many labels that you lose track. But I think there's something and it comes back to tourism potentially as well, promoting your region as a food region. I know Kent has, has a lot of that and everyone kind of thinks of Kent as the yeah, in the garden of England or wherever. Um, and we don't have that in our localities enough, I don't think. It also needs a supportive government and a, a heck of a lot more money. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Towards the yes. sector. Um, and yeah, I think Clarkson's Farm has even, you know, achieved that. I think it's even put food more on the political agenda. Yeah. Um, and so many more programs like that, please. I, yeah. I, yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Um, just, just reflecting on, on what the panelists have said and, and what your questions have been, the research gaps there are complex and interconnected. As you've seen, just James talking about the unpredictable nature of the crops plus the cost of labour plus the need for affordable electricity to store the crop and then not load distributions on. And, and then not being paid a profitable price. It really shows clearly how we need to understand all the different parts of the system well in order to help change this so that the system then supports farmers who are trying to grow these crops in a way that will also support their families. Because at the moment, and we don't have the data for this, but we know anecdotally that farmers are going out of business because it's impossible for them now to keep going. And I'm really hoping we're going to get more data that will supplement this rather than just the anecdotal stories we have to start to put together a really strong case for more support in, in all the areas that's needed. Um, we have a couple of minutes, and I just wanted to show you from, from our discussions we've had in the panel, thinking this through and so on, some of the research ideas that we've, that we've um, come, come to thinking these through. Um, one thing that we really need is a critical analysis of these conceptual frameworks of UK food systems. Uh, at, relating this to our regions, but just understanding what the trade-offs are in the sustainabilities around who our allies are, stakeholders, and um, the issue that Andrew Fern talks a lot about, about hidden and private data and not being able to access data that we need to understand the system better, and then the systemic bottlenecks and opportunities that we have in our regions. So that would be an excellent piece of research for us to do as part of our, um, as part of our progress going forward over the next year. We also need to develop and refine and test measures of sustainability, and we haven't had time to go into that. But it's complex, and it's based on the narratives that we have and understanding of what sustainability ought to be. So you have this contrast where a vertical farming system might be positioning itself as sustainable for a number of very good valid reasons alongside an organic veg box scheme which is doing the same running a kind of cooperative model and we need to know where we're trying to aim for and how then to support farmers that are, are producing it different ways um, our, we need to generate our basic data uh, to justify our actions and prioritization we have the Kent food partnership and we have um, sustainable food nourish which is recently being set up fantastic initiatives but we need the data in order to demonstrate impact so that we can then grow and scale the right initiatives 
So we need to test these hypotheses and narratives that we have as well, um, because the narratives are strong and then they stay, regardless of what evidence is coming through. That's, that's how they work. And we need to be able to understand those better. And we've all talked about the influencing consumer and stakeholder behaviours in the regions and understanding more about that. Um, so I think really this is a call for all of you. Um, it would be so interesting to hear what research you're doing, if it's related to this, to help us think through, given um, the, the crisis level that we think we're at in terms of these food systems and production, and for those involved in all stages along that, it would be really fantastic if we could work together and understand what each of your research specialisms are and where you'd like to help contribute as we collaborate over the next year with all of this. So please do continue to um, come and talk to me and the others on the panel and um, we'll hopefully then develop some, some research over the next year to start addressing the problems. So thank you very much for coming and um, I hope you enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you very much for your